Brother Branham to minister your needs by the word, by the ministry spirit which God has given him. Brother Branham. Let us remain standing just a moment while we bow our heads and talk to the Lord just a minute. Lord God, we are happy tonight because that Thou has been so good to us in the previous nights of this revival and this gathering. And how the weatherman has predicted almost each day there would be storms and rain, but You've not let it rain one time. And we're thankful to Thee for these things. Because we believe, Lord, that you have met with us and has blessed us, and we're just pouring out the very adoration of our hearts to thee. And we will ask you tonight, Lord, and to give us another great night tonight. May the Holy Spirit just move among the people and give us the exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could do or think. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to be with this meeting as it goes on through the other night's coming. Bless every minister, thy servant, that's been here. May something be done by the Holy Spirit that would inspire them to just buckle up the armor a little tighter and take the sword in the hand and move forward. Heal all the sick and the afflicted that's in our midst. Save the lost. Get glory to thyself, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You be seated. I want to thank you so much for your kindness and your attention this past five nights, how I have appreciated it with all my heart. I only wish I could stay on the rest of the meeting. But I'm going to Greenville, South Carolina now, to the Interdenominational Ministerial Association, their convention, and then on up to the Baptist people in, in North Carolina, and then from there to the Full Gospel Businessman Convention in Philadelphia. So I'm awfully tired. of come to you tired. Looks like that's about the only way I can go is tired. Someone said to me... Billy, ain't you going to never rest? I said, just when I cross Jordan, you know, I'll rest on the other side. Getting old now, you know, so I just can't go too fast, but I like to go as fast as I can. <laughs> and now uh, we appreciate all. We want to thank Brother Gordon Lindsay, Brother David Duplissy, and Brother Sorello, and many of the other brethren. It's all that's anticipated in this meeting. I don't know all the men. I had the privilege this morning of having breakfast with a group of them. While sitting at breakfast, the great Holy Spirit come down with vision, just moving in from place to place. I was so glad he'd done it because many people sometimes will think that it just happens in the meeting. Oh, no. That's the little minor side. That's the, no wonder people have doubts and so forth. You just see the very rugged age of it. The great part's when I'm alone with God. That's where... See, this is when you're using God's gift. That's when God uses His own gift. Now, when God wanted to use La uh, Jesus, His gift to the world, He took Jesus and showed Him all about what Lazarus was going to do, how many days to stay away, and then to come back and raise Him from the dead. Remember Jesus witnessed the same at the grave? Said that to so many days when it sent for Him. Lazarus dead, and I'm glad I wasn't there because they had been asking to pray for him. He knew he was going to die. And then he never said a thing about being weak after he called that man from the dead. But one little woman touched his garment, and he said, Virtue's gone from me. See? That was the woman using God's gift, and that was God using his own gift, and the woman using God's gift. See? It's God. And then you can use it with your faith, or God can use it, and He just shows you the overall picture. But this way, it's you doing it. It's your own faith doing it. Now, my ministry's changing. That's why I'm tired and going as fast as I can. Just remember, I say this before you tonight. 
There's something coming that's great and wonderful. You just remember, I'll be back at Dallas again someday, the Lord willing. And I want to come back for a regular healing campaign. Come back into the, this area here and meet with all you people again. Have a great union revival of everybody coming in together. You know, I believe Jacob dug a well and the Philistines run him away from it. And he called it malice. And he dug another well and the Philistines run him away from it. And he called it strife. He dug another well and he, he named it, said, there's room for us all. <laughs> so that's the kind I like to drink from. You know where the one hump camels or the two hump camels or the three hump camels or all of them can drink. You know, we, we can all come. That's for the Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostals, and Church of God all together. See, we all drink from this fountain. And so that's the way I love it. And now... I believe the brethren said that they took offering for me or something. I didn't come for that. God knows that. But thank you for it anyhow. God bless you. I'll assure you that not one penny will be spent for anything else as far as I know for the kingdom of God. That's right. I never took an offering in my life. My wife always gets after me when I say this. I remember one night as a pastor in the Baptist Tabernacle of Jeffersonville, and I was game warden in Indiana, so I always worked for my living. And I said, we got one of them hard places, you know, where you can't make ends meet. I wonder if anybody ever here ever hit that block. <laughs> We're all about in the same boat, aren't we? So I said, honey, I'm going to take up an offering. We didn't even have an offering plate in our church. And so she said, I'm going to watch you do it. And we just lived across the street, little two rooms. That one little room is where the voice of healing was found. And so I went across the street. And I said, folks, now, not because they wouldn't do it, they'd do anything for me, but I just didn't want them to do it. And I was able to work, so go ahead and do it. And I said, folks, I kind of hit a little snag. I said, I hold a little bill and I can't make it. I'm just going to pass my hat around tonight for a little collection. Got a nickel or dime drop in and help me a little. Well, I said, go get my hat. And the old brother, wise heart, he's in glory tonight. Went over to get my hat. The little old woman sat down in front of me, Mrs. Weber. And I seen her get down there with those old-fashioned aprons. How many ever remember women that wore those old aprons around had a pocket on the inside, you know? Sure. How many, how many Kentuckians are in here anyhow? <laughs> so... Got down under there and began to take out one of these little pocketbooks with snaps on the top, you know. Begin to reach down and get in the... Oh, my. I couldn't stand that. I couldn't have tucked that if I had to. I said, oh, I was just teasing you all to see what she was going to do. And I, Brother Wise Hart with a hat in his hand. I said, oh, Brother Jim, hang my hat up. I said, I was just teasing you. My wife looked at me. There used to be an old man, he's in glory tonight, named John Ryan. Not the blind John that was healed at Fort Wayne. This man was from Benton Harbor. Had long hair and beard. He used to ride an old bicycle. And he'd come down to my house and it backslid. I, now, I wouldn't say it backslid, it just wore out. <laughs> so he gave it to me. And I had it sitting out in the shed and I went out and got the 10 cent store and got me a can of paint and painted it all up. Put a sign on it and sold it for five dollars and then take the offering after all. <laughs> so that's as close as I ever come to taking an offering. But I'm I I what is given to me. God knows that the best of my knowledge. I I got a family, children. My expense is about a hundred dollars a day at the tabernacle and well with not the tabernacle, but my office. Send out thousands of handkerchiefs a week all over the world, everywhere. I've got people working there. And it stays alive out here. And now, I appreciate it. God bless you. And I know as a portion you're living, maybe from something that you'd give to your children, I just hate to take it. But I, well, I, the labor, the ox has to not be muzzled. You know, that's the only way I have of taking it or I wouldn't do it. So thank you kindly very much. God be with you. Now, Ever up around, if I can be any help to you, why, call me. I'll be glad to help you. The night will never get too dark or the rain fall too hard. But I'll pray or do anything I can to help you. So we're going to read some of his 
his word tonight, speak for a little while and then just a short time and have the prayer service for the sick. The boys told me out there that they're leaving too tonight, the Tate boys, and the, we've got the records back there if you care for them. Over in the book of St. Matthew, the twelfth chapter and the forty-second verse, I read this. And the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. I want to take that subject. And now... We have just read a portion of the everlasting Word of the eternal God. And how we love to read it because we can anchor our soul upon any phase of God's Word and its truth. Now, if all the Bible isn't the truth, then none of it is the truth. And it's strange that people speaking on divine healing that they will not accept it. And they'll accept, how could you preach salvation for the soul without including divine healing? For sickness is an attribute of sin. Before we had any sickness, we had no sin. Sickness came as a result of sin. Now, if a big animal had his paw in my side, call it sickness, and was scratching my side and tearing me to pieces, it isn't necessary just to cut the animal's paw off. Just knock him in the head. That kills paw and all. So then, when you kill sin, you kill every attribute of it. See? So, you, sickness is the result or an attribute of sin. Maybe not your sin, but something you've inherited. And so when you preach salvation for the soul, it has to be for the body too. Now, it's uh, the earnest of our resurrection. If there is no divine healing, there is no resurrection. Or it's just like the earnest, the same as the joy of the Lord and the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our salvation. Now, some time ago, reading in the Scriptures, people want to say that this part's all right, and that part wasn't inspired, and this is all right, and that was for another day. Where could a man base his faith? It's either every bit the truth or none of it is the truth. See? And now you can take me on record as its own tape. I'll make this statement tonight. And remember this, that if you will take the right mental attitude towards any divine promise that God has made, it will come to pass. If you can take the right mental attitude towards any of God's divine promises, He'll bring it to pass. Some time ago, there was a, a little woman that had, had a boy, and he had a call of God. And she thought, well, she wasn't very religious herself, but she was raised in church, so she said, Perhaps maybe I'll just send this boy away to a, a seminary, some good noted school, for his education if he's going to be a minister. So that's a very good thing to do. When you hear me talking about God sent us to build, not to build churches, but to preach the gospel, I mean when you put all the emphasis on church and on denomination. We have to have those things. You have to have a building to go into and so forth. But never you just think that that's all of it. That's wrong. God is what's in the building what counts, not what the building is. Thing. It's the builder of the house. Now, then this little woman, after she sent her son away and he got uh, getting his education, the lady took real sick with the pneumonia at one time, and she sent a telegram to her son to stand by that she might have to call him home at any time for uh, her passing away. And he was called, and he had his clothes packed, and a telegram came back the next day that, that his mother was all right. So when he got home, he said, Mother, there's just one thing that I want to ask you. And said, What is it, son? said, When you sent me the telegram that you were on the 
the very brink of death. And then the next day I get a telegram that, uh, that you were all right. Mother, what did the doctor give you to make you recover so quick? Oh, she said, son, he never gave me anything. Well, I said, how come you recovered so quick? She said, son, you know that little mission down around the corner there? Yes. Said there was a, having a prayer meeting down there one night, and them people didn't know me, but they said that they felt led to come up here. And there was two women come and said, Sister, we hear you're sick. Yes. Said we were felt led of the Lord to come and ask you if you'd have our pastor to come up here and pray for you. Why? She said, certainly I'd be glad to. And said the pastor come up and read some out of the Bible and and anointed me with oil, prayed me over me, and said the next morning the Lord had healed me and I was well. Oh, he said, Mother. He said, Surely you don't believe that. She said, Well, son, it surely happened. Well, I said, Look. I said, Where did he read from? Well, I said, He read from Mark 16. And he said, He read like this These signs shall follow them that believe. And he read it out of the Bible, honey. Oh, he said, Mother. said, You can't. said, Them people are holy rollers. said, You can't pay no attention to what they say. Why, well, she said, holy roller or no holy roller? They answered the prayer. God did. Why, well, he said, Mother, he said, there's no such a thing as divine healing. said, we learned that in school. said, there's no such a thing as divine healing. She said, honey, he read it out of the Bible. Why, well, I said, Mother, you see, those people are not educated. said, you see, at the school we learned that Mark, the 16th chapter, from the 9th verse on, is not inspired. She said, Hallelujah! Why, well, said, Mother, you're acting like them, the very audacity. said, Well, you're acting like them. said, What's the matter with you? She said, I was just a thinking. said, What was you thinking? said, If God could heal me with the uninspired word, what could he do with that as really inspired? <laughs> oh, that's right. What would that inspired part do if the uninspired would do it? <laughs> Oh, it's all inspired. The people today, you'll hear it all. The medical doctor will say, Well, don't you pay any attention to that sawbone, that surgeon. The surgeon will say, You need an operation, not sugar pills. And the, both of them will say, The chiropractor don't have nothing to do with him. And the chiropractor will say, Have nothing to do with the osteopath. And they'll all say, Have nothing to do with the preacher. You know what I think? I think it's selfish motives. Because we all know that medicine does good, surgery does good, chiropractic and osteopathic, and so does the preacher. Look, if they had the right motive, we would all go arm in arm to do everything we can in our powers and our ability to make the journey of our pilgrim friends a little more happier as we go along through life. Anything different from that is selfishness and money motive or something behind it. Yes, sir. Today you can speak of a miracle. They want to take and examine it and scientifically prove it. Well, you can't scientifically prove God. There's all, you, your knowledge in science takes you away from God. You don't know God by knowledge. You don't know God by science. You know God by faith, and that's the only way you can find God, is by faith you know God. There was two trees in the Garden of Eden. One of them was knowledge, and the other was faith. And when man left the tree of faith, life, and took a bite off the tree of knowledge, he separated his fellowship from God. Every time he takes a bite, he takes himself farther away. You can never find God on that tree. It's this tree you find him on. Over here, the tree of life, which is by faith. By faith are you saved, and that by grace. Now, in this age, what if Moses would have lived in this age and would have seen that tree burning? Why, many of them, he'd said, wait a minute, I'll see that that fire goes off of it, and I'll go over and pick some of the leaves off and take it down to the laboratory and, and examine it and see what chemicals are on those leaves so that they don't burn. If he thought that, it would never talk to him. What did he do? He just sat down and began to talk to it. He didn't question it. 
He just began to speak to it. And when that real feeling begins to move over you that you're a sinner and you're wrong, just go to talking to it. Find out what takes place. They won't have to take you and analyze your body to see what happened. Your spirit will let you know what happened when God comes in. God in all ages has had gifts that He's brought to the people. He's always made Himself known in all ages by His gifts. And Jesus here had just been called Beelzebub. And he, he had told them that He would forgive them for doing that. But when the Holy Spirit came, and if they spoke against that, it would never be forgiven. See, because many people have said, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? My old southern mama used to tell me it was for a woman to have a barginant case, take life that she couldn't restore. That's the best that she knows. But that isn't it. The blasphemy of the Holy Ghost is to call the working of the Spirit an unclean thing or an evil thing. Jesus said, because they said he has an evil spirit, calling the Holy Spirit in its work an evil thing. That's unforgivable. There's nothing in the world any time or any place could ever forgive you for that, for speaking one word against the operation of the Holy Spirit. And remember, I'll show you how clear it is. Now, those Pharisees didn't say right out, say you're Beelzebub, but they thought it in their mind. And Jesus perceived their thoughts. Read right back in St. Matthew 12 and see if that isn't right. They thought in their minds that it was, he was Beelzebub. And Jesus perceived their thoughts. And they thought he was a fortune teller. And then he said, I'm going to forgive you. See, your thoughts in heaven is louder than your voice is on earth. Remember that. What you think. If there be any praise, if there be any virtue, think on these things, said the Scripture. And then we notice here that he had referred to an age gone by. And he was parading these cities where his mighty works had been done of that discernment and healing. And he said, Capernaum, you're exalted in the heaven, but you'll be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works had been done in... Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have been a standing till this day. And then he referred the previous scripture just behind this verse to Jonah. How that Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and preached to those people that were so illiterate till they didn't know which was right and left hand. And they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he was upbraiding them for that. Now, many people get the wrong conception of Jonah. We try saying, he's a Jonah. I'd like to stop just a minute for him. Jonah, he was no bad person. He was a real man of God. There's nothing happens providential to a real true servant of God. It all works together for good to them that love God. And Jonah was commissioned to go to Nineveh. But that ship going to Tarsha wasn't the release to the least resistance. It was God's provided way. And men who are honest and sincere in their hearts. And you be sincere no matter what happens. It's God moving you. Now notice, the whale swallowed the prophet. And I've always felt sorry for Jonah. Now we know he was backslidden, or we think he was. Had his hands tied behind him, and he was down in the belly of the whale in the bottom of the sea and a big storm on the sea. Now there's many people who get prayed for, and they'll go through a prayer line with a crippled hand, crippled foot, a sick stomach, and they'll next morning get up and say, I I'm just sick as it was. 
Oh, what you need is some good Bible teaching. See? You don't look at the symptom. You look at the Word, the promise. It's never what this. If you look at that, you'll never get well. Notice Jonah. If there's any man that ought to have had a good case of symptoms, it was Jonah. He was backslid, hands tied behind him, in the belly of a whale in the bottom of a stormy sea. If he looked this way, it was whale's belly. That way it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked, it was whale's belly. Well, now, there's no one here in that condition. That's right. And Jonah, what did he say? He refused to look at it. He said, they are lying vanities. And once more will I look toward your holy temple, O God. For he knew when Solomon dedicated that temple, he prayed this prayer. Lord, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and look at this holy place, where the pillar of fire was behind the altar, if they'll look towards this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. And if Jonah, under those conditions, could look towards a temple that was built by a man that later backslid and have faith in his prayer and get the results that he did under the conditions, how much more can we tonight look away from our conditions to the temple of God where Jesus sits at the right hand of His majesty with His own blood to make intercession upon our confession. Then don't look at your hand. Don't feel your sickness. Look at who made the promise. At the right hand of the majesty on high to make intercession upon your confession. Then make it and stand true to it. I'd like to carry Jonah a little further. God, but that faith must have put an oxygen tent down in the belly of that whale. He kept him alive for three days and nights. But look what God's a doing. No matter what takes place, God will make it praise him anyhow. Now we know that the people of Nineveh, I am told that they were heathens and they were living in sin and adultery. And then... They come to find out that the God of the sea was the whale. And all the fishermen along the side of the sea was out there fishing. And here come a whale spinning through the water, opened up his mouth, and the prophet walked out. Sure they would hear it. God has a way of doing things. And it wasn't providential that he took the wrong ship. It was God's eternal promise and God's eternal way of doing things. Of bringing a message. He shook shivers up and down their backs. When he seen the sea god open up its mouth, the prophet walk out the Bible in his hand. Sure they'd believe it. God always has signs and wonders. Works in the supernatural to make people to believe him. Certainly. And he walked out of the belly of the whale and began to go through the streets preaching. And Jesus said that those people repented, those ignorant, unlearned, didn't know G from Hall, or right hand from left hand, I mean to say. Uh, excuse me for saying that. I didn't mean to say that. All right. How many farmers in here know what G and Hall is? Well, you know what I mean. Man. All right. He didn't know the right from the left hand. And they repented. And we are supposed to be an educated smart, intelligent bunch of people that's living in a day when a greater than Jonah is here. What about this? To that poor, ignorant people. I want you to notice, Jesus said. They said, show us a sign. He said, there will be no sign given to a wicked and adulterous generation, but the sign of Jonah. Now watch, what was the sign of Jonah? As the Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man must be in the heart of the earth three days and nights. So what would be the sign to a wicked and adulterous generation? The sign of the resurrection. Hey, 
Amen. The sign of the resurrection. Sure it is. There we are. And we're living in a wicked and adulterous generation. As my good friend Jack Moore once said, if God lets this America get by without punishing it, he'll be obligated as a just God to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for burning them up. That's right. Sure, we are living in an awful age. A teenage rulership, rock and roll, boogly woogly, all that ungodly carrying on of filth and gum and untrue living divorces on the run and perversion and homosexuals and oh, it's a awful, t- just like it was in Sodom. The same thing we're having. Then the Holy God's obligated. He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. And he promised that he would give this wicked adulterer in his generation the sign of his resurrection. And if he's raised from the dead, he'll do the same sign that he did before he died if he's raised again. So then he said, and also... The queen of the south shall rise in the day of judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the known world in that day to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, I say unto you that a greater than Solomon is here. Then he was trying to tell them, now... In the days of Solomon, anyone knows that when God sends his gift to the world and the world receives it, the church receives it, then it is a golden jubilee for that people in that age. But if they turn it down, it's chaos for that age. Look, the Jews received Solomon and it was the golden age. Anyone knows that. It was almost a millennium for Israel. And they turned Christ down and the temple was burnt and they were scattered to the four winds of the world. When God sends a gift and His church rallies around it, then that church and people is blessed. If they turn it down, they are turned down with it. Now notice, in the days of Solomon... God had set him up and given him a great gift of discernment. Oh, what a powerful discernment he had. And all Israel rallied around that discernment. And they all believed it with one accord. Oh, I'd like to ask to my good friend here tonight, Brother Tommy Hicks and many of these men here who has international ministries, what would happen... If all of the people that call by the name of the Lord, if every one of them were to rally around the great gift of God today, the Holy Spirit, what would take place? What would take place if every born-again Christian and Texas rallied around the gift of God? Texas would be the most popular place in all the world. What a millennium it would be if we'd all rally around the gifts of God. But they don't. And now they all did in Solomon's days. And his great fame was known throughout all the world. There was no wars. They were afraid of him. If America would have rallied around Jesus Christ, you'd never have to worry about Russia coming in or nothing else coming in. They wouldn't have to spend all of our money and times making hydrogen bombs and trying to fly over to the moon with another tower of Babel. God's got the program right here for us and got His power, but we turn it down. We try to make one ourselves. See? It'll never work. Now notice, but all rallied around this great gift and the fame of it spread to all the known world. And way down in Sheba, the queen, little queen, 
She heard of it. Why, every passerby would come through and say, Oh, you should be up in Israel. They've got a great God up there who still lives. Why, they've got a man up there that's anointed with his spirit, with only wisdom that could come from God. Now, I see, she was a pagan. Then she began to think, you know, faith cometh by hearing. But the trouble with us, when God sends a gift, they say, that don't belong to my denomination. Have nothing to do with it. No. See, that's the reason we're going into the chaos. And everyone with one accord, believe it, they built the big temple and everything in Solomon's age. And this little woman, every person that come through Israel would come down there and say, oh, it's marvelous. You should see why there never was a man on earth could have wisdom like that. It has to come from the gods. Oh, it could not come by man. Well, you know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the word. And if you're really sincere, God will make a way for you to see whether it's the truth or not. Well, I can see the little queen then. She began to think, now wait, I'm a pagan. Oh, now, if I go up there, I'm going to have to go to the state presbyter or the bishop or, or the general overseer or somebody and see if they'll permit me to go. After all, you know, we haven't got nothing here but just an old dead set of creeds that tell us about a, a God that once lived, but they tell me there's a real God somewhere that's answering. I want to go find out. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. <laughs> they shall be filled. Well, of course, she went over to see the, the great bishops of her church and her being the queen, and I can hear them say, Now, just a moment. We got Dagon. We got these other gods here. They're just. But she says, You see, you've been telling me all about Dagon and about what he was, but I've never seen him make a move yet. <laughs> I don't mean to hurt too bad, but I want to settle down to the place where it will get you thinking. What good is a God of Moses if he isn't the same God today? What good is a historical God do if he isn't the same power today? What good would it do to take a man that's freezing to death and you met him on the street and he was freezing and he took him up to a big painted fire and say, oh, sir, 2,000 years ago, that was a warm fire. Well, he can't get warm by a painted fire and neither can he get warm by or saved by a historical Holy Spirit. He's got to be the same Holy Spirit with the same power and warmth that he was at any time. What good does it do to feed your canary bird's vitamins and then keep him in a cage? Make good bones and good feathers and won't let him fly. Well, that's the same way of sending your preachers away to seminaries and making them polished scholars and telling you the days of miracles is past. What good does it do to serve a historical God or learn anything if he won't act the same today that he was then? He's no good. It's just history. The Mohammeds are just as well off as we are. And then the rest of them. But I thank God that we've got a God that lives and he's just the same, and he has the same power. He lives just the same as he ever lived. He does the same things that he ever did do. Why he remains God. He's not a historical God, but he's a God in a time of trouble, a very present help, all times, all the present, ever ready. Hallelujah. Now, so I guess her and the bishop had it out. And I can hear the bishop say, now, looky here, you may be queen. But if you go, we'll excommunicate you <laughs> just as soon as you go. But, you know, if God's dealing with a heart, you just might as well excommunicate to start with. Because they'll go anyhow. For as a heart thirsts for the water brook, so my soul thirsts after the old God. Farmer, I don't mean this for a joke. No place for a joke. But I want to make a point. A farmer set a hen one time. They didn't have enough eggs to set her. How many knows what a set of eggs is? Fifteen. <laughs> All right. So he 
Like he only had 14, he went over and got a, a goose egg or duck egg, put it under the old hen. When she hatched all these fellows out, they all looked all right, but this duck, he's a funny looking fellow. And she'd get out in the barnyard, you know, and catching grasshoppers and carrying on, cluck, 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 but that duck couldn't understand that language at all. He's a funny looking fellow, big long bill, and I don't know, there's just something wrong with him. And he didn't look like the chickens, and they all picked on him. They said, well, you're not our brother, or you're holy, or, or you're something, you know. Get away. You're not, you have nothing to do with us. We don't want to. And you know, and the old hen, she got out behind the barn one day, and she was catching grasshoppers and scratching in a manure pile and so forth, and actually feeding her chickens, of course. So they fed on that. So then the little duck got back there, and there had to be some, a stream come down behind the place. Brother, he is tired of that dust anyhow, that old dry place. And he got a smell of water. He stuck that little honker up in the air and away he went. The old hen said, cluck, cluck, cluck. And he said, quack, quack, quack. He was headed for the water. Just as You couldn't hold him. Why? His nature was a duck. When he smelt water, his nature called it. And if you're born in this world, predestinated to be a son of God, the A&F, religions in the world to hold you away from the real genuine Holy Ghost when it begins to fall, you'll go just as hard. The church might excommunicate you, run you out, blackball you, anything else. You'll go to the fountain filled with blood gone from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. Oh, That's right. So as this old a priest and them begin to say, Now, look here, noble queen, you are an honorable woman, the best member of our church, the best pair we got here. We just don't want to lose you. So you stay away from them fanatics up there. there if there's any God to make a move, he'd move in our organization here, see. You'd be right here in our. Don't you worry. We got just as bigger God as they got. But you know, something began to dig in her heart. But they tell me, that that God loves His people so well till He manifested Himself through His people. That's still the same God that we have. I am the vine, ye are the branches. See? Notice, and then she said, well, she just couldn't rest. And another fellow come by, oh, queen, glad to see you. Say, I just passed through Israel. You ought to see that spirit of discernment. It's far beyond any man that ever walked on the earth. It comes from their God. Well, her heart hungered and wanted to go. Now, the little queen had a lot to, to confront to go. She had a lot of things. First thing, she was a woman. And then she had all these things to confront. The first place was she had to give up her church if she went. Well, God was calling, so she started making ready. And I remember, she said, You know what? I've served these old dead creeds so long. If that really is a God that's alive and proven Himself alive, I'm going to support it. So she packed up a few camels full of gold and silver. I'm not pulling for offerings now, but see, if it's worth anything, it's worth everything. And she said, if it is the truth, I'm going to support it. If it isn't the truth, I'm going to bring my money back with me. That's a good idea. That's right. If He's God, be for Him. If he's not, then keep away from it. I want to know where the real God is. I want to know where the one that answers, the one that keeps his word. I want to deal and have my associates with men that will keep their word to me. I want my neighbors to be the same way. And I want God. He will keep his word. Then she said she packed up some camels and got it ready and got gold and frankincense and myrrh and great costly things. She said, I will take my treasures up there, and if it is the truth that that really is a, a gift of God working, then I'm going to support it. If it isn't, I can bring my money back. But I'm going to find out for myself. Now, that's a good idea. Go find out for yourself. Don't take what somebody else says. Go see for yourself. Like, like Philip told Nathaniel, say, could any good thing come out of Nazareth, he said, come and see. That's the best way. Come find out. If you don't believe the Holy Spirit's real, that quickens your mortal bodies, that gives you joy and happiness and kills sin in your life, come find out once. 
Take him at his word. If you don't believe he's a healer, step out and take his word one time. Any promise he's made, he stands right behind it. Now notice, then another thing she had to do. Being a woman, she had to confront now the desert. Now, do you know how far it is from, from Palestine down across the Sahara Desert to Sheba? Well, it takes just exactly three months on the back of a camel. Now, she didn't have like we'd have an air-conditioned Cadillac to come across that desert in. She had to come on the back of a camel to see a man that had a gift and not just take her two hours of her time, but would take her three months. And some of the people today won't walk across the street to see something greater than was them. No wonder Jesus said she'll stand in the day of judgment and condemn this generation. Look what she had to do. Now, she had three months on the back of a camel in a desert. Now, remember, the desert was full of Ishmael's children, which were robbers. And all that gold on this little bunch of camels with a few widows with her women and some eunuchs to guard her, just a little bitty bunch of men, what would that great tribe of Ishmael do? Run right in and cut them down and take... She had all that to confront. But you know, if you're really wanting to find out truth, God will take you to the fountain. Don't you never worry about that. There's nothing will stand in your way. There's no organization. There's no papa, no mama, no neighbor, no brother, no sister, no friend, no nothing can separate you from God if you really hunger to find God. She takes out on the camel to go through that hot sun. Oh, what a time it was of on this camel now for three months, 90 days, to come to find out whether it was the truth or not. And we today, as ministers sometimes, will condemn a thing and say it's of the devil before we even go search the Scriptures about it. Now, what will... After we've had 2,000 years of teaching since then, what will we do when she stands in the day of judgment? What will that woman say in the day of judgment when Dallas rises in the resurrection? What will she say in the day of judgment when the whole United States rises in the day of judgment? When this great, mighty revival has swept the country and people's branded it fanaticism, the devil, polished up soothsayer, some kind of an evil spirit, fortune teller, mind reader. What will they do in the day of judgment? And she finally arrives. God made a way for her to arrive. He'll make a way for you to arrive. There's people, I just met two boys out here. Their mother was healed in Arkansas not long ago. And there they've been out here sleeping in cars and bushes. Not because they wanted healing, but they just love to come. They hear that God's a visiting us. And they love to watch His works. A gangster put his arm around me out there. A man that was a gangster, killing and murdering, and has been saved. And for the past months, the man hitchhiking on the road, all through Maine and everywhere, falling around, sleeping in bushes, in the car, anywhere he could, because he loves God. And there's something in it he says, just stirs my soul, Brother Branham. I must come. God bless him. What, what, will the, what will the mayor of the city and the great man of this town and the religionists of this town will do when they stand with that man in the day of the judgment? What will happen to the preachers of this city? Many of them who turn it down, sets fanaticism, warning your people not to get around it. See, there you are. But God sends his gifts just the same. He has to do it. He's sovereign. He must do it. He has in all ages. When they turn it down, that's up to them. Now, remember, she traveled through the desert, and finally she arrived at the place. Now, she didn't come just to stay about five minutes, and the first time the preacher said something didn't agree with her doctrine, she'd grab her hat and run out of the building. 
That's the way we do it today. Well, come up like a big toad frog and said in the meeting, I'll find out. I'll just see what he says. If he says one more out of life, remember it, Molly. I'm getting out and getting out of here. And then expect to stand and sing, Dear my God. <laughs> there you are. She came and pitched her camp right in the door. I like that. She come to stay till she was satisfied she'd found out the truth. She come to stay till the revival is over. She wasn't just running around. She come to mean business. We can't sit five minutes. But she come to stay for months. She come to stay until she was convinced whether it was of God or wasn't of God. And then I can see her the next morning as she walks into the main auditorium. Solomon the pastor comes out, takes the seat, and the first thing they begin to bring cases up that no man in the world. And she begin to watch that spirit of discernment. Begin to move in Solomon. She watched. Her heart began to jump. See, God was on the inside. She began to look. That's just exactly it. And the first thing you know, the next case come up. There was Solomon stood, just a man. But a, a discernment that could only come from God. She watched that discernment. She said that would have to be a God. It couldn't be a man doing that. And after a while, when she was fully convinced, she stood in the congregation and she said, Go get them camels and pour out all the gold and silver that I brought. And I want to say this, that everything I heard was the truth and more than I heard is the truth because Solomon discerned her too. And Jesus said she'll stand in the resurrection at the last days and condemn this generation. For she came from the utmost parts of the world to hear a gift of God and see it operate in her age. And he said, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And we've had 2,000 years since then. And here this Jesus that was talking died, buried, raised again, and 2,000 years here in the church as the vine moving through his branches, doing exactly the same thing that he did back there, and people won't come across the street to hear it. What will take place in the resurrection? Brother, that may come before morning. We don't know when. Remember, that sign of discernment is the last message to the Gentile church. Look, so that you'll know, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man, as it was in the days of Noah. Now watch, Noah was a flood, and then he went in the ark, but Sodom was burnt up. Now watch the angel who came to the church. Lot was backslid. There's two other angels went to them. But the main church was Abraham and his house. And the angel come up as a man. And he sat down to Abraham with his back turned to the tent. The Bible said he had his back to the tent. And Sarah was in the tent. And he said, Abraham, seeing that you're the, going to be the heir of the world, would I keep from you what I'm going to do? He said, just about a, this time next month, according to the life, the 28 days, he said, I'm going to visit you and fulfill the promise you've been waiting for now for 25 years. And when he said that, Sarah, to his back inside the tent, laughed with herself. And the angel looking at Abraham in the face said, why did Sarah laugh? What was that message? Sarah said, no, no, I didn't laugh. He said, oh, yes, you did. What kind of a telepathy was that? But remember, that was the angel, and that angel was God. Abraham called him Elohim, which is Almighty God. Almighty God manifests Himself in flesh, His Son, Jesus Christ. And Almighty God, the same pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, manifested in flesh in Jesus Christ. I have come from God and go to God. After his death, burial, and resurrection, returned back and was in a pillar of fire that blinded St. Paul on the road to Damascus, came into the Peter and got him out of prison. 
And that same angel is here tonight with his picture taken many times among us, producing the same thing that he did at the tent of Abraham. That was before, not the water, the fire. And this is the last message before the fire. Sodom will burn. God will be innocent because he sent his angel, his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And people have turned it down flatly because of intellectual conceptions of the gospel. Instead of a born-again experience, how can you see godless God's in you? How can you get blood out of a turnip? There's no blood in it. Same way you can't get a believer unless God's in there to make him a believer. It has to be. Not an intellectual, but an experience in the heart. You know, the old disbeliever said many years ago that God made a mistake. Said there was nothing in the heart, no mental faculties to believe with. He meant in your head. If he meant head, he said head. He said heart. Now, two years ago, I was in Chicago in big headlines. Science has found out that in the human heart, not the animal, in the human heart, there's a little teeny cell, or a little teeny compartment, rather, that doesn't even have a cell in it. And they said it's the occupant of the soul. After all, then a man does believe from his heart. You think with your mind, but you believe from your heart. See? Then we, it, the mind will reason. You say, now, now, wait, I'm in this condition. Maybe the lady up there with that little child. Uh, that my child's past. Oh, no, sir. Maybe the young fellow in a wheelchair, the man with the crutches. See? I, I, I'm too bad. Don't cast them reasonings down. Let that message that I tell you soak down into your heart. Then there's not enough devils in the world can make you look at anything else but his promise. You'll do like the prophet said, oh, these things are lying vanities. I'll look to your holy temple, Lord. You made the promise, and there I stand. Abraham called those things which were not as though they were after he had met God. That's the first thing. You have to have an experience. If you don't have an experience, you won't have faith. Every man, every Christian that calls the name of Jesus has no right at all in the pulpit until he's had a backside of the desert experience. Doctors might be able to come and explain it out to you. Doctors of divinity. These, that, and that way and twist the scriptures around. But if a man's ever come to that backside of the desert like Moses in his 40 years of training, but five minutes in the presence of that burning bush, he knowed more about God than they could have trained him in a million years. You, they might explain all this away and that away, but if you've ever met God, you've had an experience. You know you and God alone stood on those grounds, and Satan can't put his dirty, nasty feet on it. That's right. You know. And Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth. As the last days he'll stand. Satan can't put his feet on those grounds where you and God stood alone. They're holy and separated from anything else. You were there. You was a person that happened to and you know it's real. That's the reason in these meetings, when I see his scripture produced that he would do these things and watch him move up, see him take the picture for the scientific world, the unbeliever, so they're without excuse. And then see him come out to the church and manifest himself, move through poor mortal beings. A man hold himself out and say, Lord God, here I am. A little woman sitting out in the audience, oh Lord, here I am. And watch that Holy Spirit come back. And the fruit of the vine that it comes from. The is what, all what will we do the day of What will happen to this adulterous generation seeing that sign of the living God who's been living after 2,000 years? The queen of the south shall rise and condemn it. Because she stood at the gift of Solomon and said, Truly, it's of God. Truly. But people's afraid to stand today. Don't be afraid to make your stand for God. If you don't stand for him, you'll stand alone. Danny Greenfield, not long ago, a, a famous preacher went through Central America here, and he said he dreamed one night he died, and said when he died, he thought he went up to heaven. He, he knocked at the door, and the or doorkeeper come, he said, who approaches this holy place? He said, I'm Danny Greenfield from America, the evangelist. He said, just a moment, Mr. Greenfield, I'll look on the book and see if I see your name. When he looked on the book, he said, Sorry. No Dan Greenfield here. He said, Sir, I was an evangelist in America. 
And I held great meetings. And hundreds of people received the Lord Jesus. Said, surely you overlooked my name. He said, there's no Dan Greenfield here, sir. You're not registered. He said, what can I do? He said, the only thing the angel said, the only thing I know you can do, you might appeal your case to the great white throne. He said, well, if that's my only hope, I'll have to do it. He said, it seemed like he started off moving. And he moved through space for a long time, real swiftly. He said, he began to come into a light. And as he got deeper and deeper into light, it seemed like it wasn't coming from any certain place, but just a great light. He said, he got slower and slower until he got right and seemed like the mist of it. And he stopped. He said, such a feeling. He said, he trembled all over and said directly, a voice came from there that would have shook the world to pieces. He said, who is it approaches my throne of judgment? He said, ah, Danny Greenfield. The American advances. He said, Mr. Greenfield, you have come to my justice? Yes, he said, Lord, I have come to your justice. He said, I will judge you by my holy laws. He said, Danny Greenfield... Did you ever tell a lie? He said, I was just ready to say, no, I never t-. said, but I thought I had told some things that wasn't altogether the truth. Said, he said, yes, Lord, I've told lies. He said, Danny Greenfield, did you ever steal? He said, surely I could answer that. I thought I'd been honest. But said, in the presence of that great light, I remembered a lot of shady deals I pulled. And brother, sister, you think you're all right under this light. Or wait till you get the presence of that light. Better be sure. He said, yes, Lord, I'll stole. He said, Danny Greenfield, the inner end of my kingdom, thou must be perfect. Was you perfect? He said, no, Lord, I wasn't perfect. He said, all my bones begin to come loose. He said, I know that the next great delight would come. I hear that great voice say, separate from me forever, you worker of iniquity. said, just as I was listening for that voice, that I heard the sweetest voice I ever heard in my life. said, there was no mother's voice could ever be like that. And said, I turned to look, and I saw the sweetest face that I ever looked at. said, no mother's face could be that sweet. And said, he come close, put his arm around me. He said, Father, truly, Danny Greenfield wasn't perfect in his life. But here's one thing Danny Greenfield did do. When he was on earth, he stood for me, and I'll stand for him here. Who would stand for you tonight, friends? If you were going tonight, let's bow our heads and think of it just for a moment. The queen stood when she seen the gift of God working. She stood and she said, it's all true. And tonight, while God's greatest gift, the Holy Ghost, is moving in this audience, I wonder if you'd make a stand tonight to your feet and say, God, be merciful to me. It's all true that I need you. And... No one can stand for me in that day but you. And I'm going to stand for you now so that you will stand for me in that day. While we're thinking, waiting a moment, if you feel your need of Christ, will you just raise up your hand? God bless you, lady. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, sir. God bless you, lady. God bless you, 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 you back there. Way down in here to my left. Lord bless you. Do my ride over here now. Anywhere inside or out. God, I feel my need of you. I want to raise my hand. God bless you, young fella. I want to raise my hand. God bless you, lady sitting here. God bless you, young lady. All them teenage girls. God bless her soul. Young fella back there. That lady, God bless you. Outside. Outside men or women outside of Christ who want you just say, Lord God, right now, I may never see you again, friends. I may be back here again someday. I may never live to come back. God bless you, ladies sitting here. I may never live to come back. And if I would, and this group of people of this size tonight, if I'd come back a year from now, as many of you wouldn't be here. You'd be gone. 
The next time I see you in my life, many of you here, the next time you see my face, will be at the judgment bar where the Queen of Sheba will be standing there. She made her stand. Are you good enough in yourself, you think, to stand there? Are you really trusting His mercy? And you want to stand? You want Him to stand for you. You don't want to try to stand in your own righteousness. You want His grace and mercy. Someone who hasn't raised their hand, would you just raise your hand and say, God, be merciful to me. I now need you, Lord. Here's my hand. God bless you, young lady. God bless you, young lady. My, the teenage girls everywhere. God bless you. There's another one back here. That's right. God bless you, lady here. The, these little girls, just the trap. America's God is a woman. You know that. It's on her money. She, uh, America, her God is a woman. Hollywood and all the immorals and things has proved it. God bless this little baby girl, not over about ten years old, with her little hand up. Not nothing against my sisters. They're the cream of the crop. Ladies, you're God's daughter. Certainly you are. But oh, how this fashion world takes the lady and strips her clothes and oh, what a pitiful thing. And you, a lot of times, young man, with your eyes lusting and looking, turn your head, brother. If you look, you'll be guilty of adultery. Sister, if you present yourself like that, no matter how clean you try to live, God will make you answer for committing adultery with a sinner that looked at you. You need his help? If you do, just raise your hand just before praying now. God bless you. That's good. All right. God bless this young lady over here, too. Let us pray now. Heavenly Father, we are taught that in... The book of science, it claims that a man can't raise his hand scientifically because gravitation holds his arms down. But when a man raises his hand, it shows it's something besides science. It's a spirit that can make him defy gravitation. And what made him raise his hand? Because the angel of God was there and said, Son, daughter, you're wrong. And they made a decision. And they raise their hand upward from whence the Creator shall come. And recognize that by raising your hand to the Creator, I'm wrong, O Lord, forgive me. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. 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 I pray with all my heart. These are your words, Jesus. I quote them to the over again, so Satan will know that it's your word. You said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath, present tense, eternal life, and shall never come to the judgment, but hath, past tense, passed from death unto life. How we thank you for that, Lord. Those hearts, I believe, Lord, they come, those hands come from true, honest hearts. And again it's written, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. So you're here. They are the gems of this message tonight, Lord. I pray that you'll keep them now, and you will present them to your Son as love gifts. No man can pluck them from his hand. Raise them up in the last day, and when the Queen of the South stands, may they stand in the justice of Jesus Christ at that day, because they come, maybe not from the utmost parts of the earth, but maybe against creeds and denominations that would have kept them away, against the wicked devil that would send these young girls out into roadhouses and smoking cigarettes and wearing shorts and carrying on. He would have kept them there, and these young men from drinking and crowding. But tonight they stepped right out, raised their hand up, Lord God, be merciful to me. Then I know they're yours, Lord. I expect to see them in a better world where there's no more sickness or sorrow or death. They're yours, Father, and we present them to you. May they find a real good church home, be baptized, and there be filled with the Holy Ghost, and live true until death shall set them free, and they come in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Now, immediately after the service is over, you that raised your hands, I want you to come up around here after the healing service and pray, God, for give me that grace. Thirty, forty, fifty hands went up around the building. I want you to come and pray around here after this is over. Now, friends, all that I have said in the nights, all that I have said would be just fall by the wayside if God doesn't make himself known that he's still the same God. Now, I want you to know this. And I say this with all respects and godly fear. There isn't a man in this world that could do anything for you except first your faith be in a finished work that Christ did at Calvary. See? There is Paul King here somewhere, sitting here. A great ministry. Tommy Hicks, many other. Brother Carl Pepper, many of these here. Brother Lindsay. Went around the world, many of them, preaching, great revival. Ask them if they ever healed anybody. Certainly not. They preached the Word. God did the work. No matter how much the gospel is preached, how present God was, if you draw back and don't believe it, they can never help you. They might anoint you with oil, put hands on you, or do anything in the world. It would never help you until you... Your faith moves from here down into here. You say, yes, God, I believe it. Look, what is faith? i got a minute, have I? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, seeing isn't believing. It isn't. Many times. Come here, Paul. Here's a man standing by me, got on a gray coat, dark hair. How many believe that? Sure, you see it. I don't see him now, but he's still there. You want to argue with me he's not? How do I know he's there? Because I feel him. I've got another sense. I feel him. See? Now, I cannot feel him now, but I see him. Now, what is, thank you, Purple. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you do not see, taste, feel, smell, or hear. You believe it. And if every person in here believes that Jesus Christ is present, and it's going to heal you just the same as your sight, if you can see, says that shirt's white. That's, it's settled. See? If the sense of faith says it's right, just the same as the sense of sight says it's right, it's over. You don't need praying for or nothing. See? It's all over. Now, what is it? Here's faith. Let me show you. I'm starving to death. And I'm standing here hungry. And you pass by and say, hello, Brother Branham. I say, how do you do? What's the matter, Brother Branham? I'm starving to death. What will save your life? A loaf of bread? All right? Here's 25 cents, Brother Branham, for a loaf of bread, the purchase price. Walk away. Well, I'll take that 25 cents. It's not just make-believe. I'm holding 25 cents. Okay? All right. I can start rejoicing and be just as happy with that 25 cents as I can with a loaf of bread. Why? Because I've got the purchase power of a loaf of bread. Now, I'm, I may not have it, and I may have to walk five miles to get it. I may have to go over bridges and down over broad patches and across the creek and over the foot log and up over the hill. But all along, I can be shouting and I can be just as happy with a quarter as I can before I get the loaf of bread as I have after I've got it. Because I've got the purchase power of it. I've got the thing that buys it. It's settled. I've got 25 cents. That's what takes to buy bread. No matter whether my hand comes straight, my ears come open, as long as something in my heart says it's finished. Hallelujah. I can shout the praises of God. I got it. Yes, sir. Because why? I've got the purchase power. I believe it. Now, what is this Bible the truth? Or isn't it the truth? If it isn't the truth, away with it. If it is the truth, believe it. Jesus made a promise. I, a little while in the world, won't see me no more. That world caused my so Greek word, which means the world order. Many times the church, the so-called church, the world. They won't see me anymore. They can't see me. Yet ye shall see me. That's the church. For I, personal pronoun, I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also. More than this shall you do. Now the King James says greater, but if you look the right translation, how could it be greater? Raise the dead, stop nature, done everything. More, because why? It'll be all universal. God was in one place and His Son, Christ. Now He's in the church. Universal. Well, there's 10,000 times more being done now than it was done in the days of Christ. 
Because here we're going through something here, another man's going through persecution, and another's raising the dead, and another's opening blinded eyes all over the world right now. His great church universal. Hallelujah. Oh, you're going to call me a whole school anyhow, so I might as well call her hallelujah, because I mean, praise our God, and he's, he's worthy of all praises. He's here now. After being dead. Now, if you went to a pumpkin vine, you'd expect to find pumpkins. You went to a watermelon vine, you expect to find watermelons. You went to a grape vine, you go to grapes. And if you come to the church, you don't expect theology and arguing and fussing. You expect to see the life of Christ, the vine, moving in the branches, bringing forth the same Spirit that lived in the Lord Jesus. For He lives. He's alive today. If He is, He'll do the same works. Jesus said, if I do not the works of my Father that sent me, then believe me not. And you people here just received Christ a while ago. If God doesn't come into this church tonight and do the same thing He did when He was here in the Lord Jesus, like He's always done, then believe it not. But if He does, then rejoice. Heathens has God, but they're dead. We have God that's alive. Not a painted fire, a living Jesus. And if he comes and performs, remember he said the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. St. John 5, 19. You ever read it? How many ever read that? The Son can do nothing. I know scriptures can be broken. Jesus said so. So Jesus never did one miracle until he saw the Father do it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that's absolutely, absolutely, I say to you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees, not hears, not revealed, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. For the Father worketh, and I worketh hitherto. See it? Then, when a woman one time, where he saw no vision for her, she touched his garment, went out and sat in the audience. He said, Who touched me? They said, The whole multitude. And Peter rebuked him. He said, But I got weak. And he looked around until he found the woman, told her a blood issue had been stopped because her faith had saved it. Is that right? Now, I want to ask you, minister, something. Does the Scripture say that Jesus Christ tonight is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? Does he say it? Well, then, if he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, how would you know you touched him if he didn't act the same as he did then? If he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll have to act the same as he did yesterday, today, and forever. If he did that sign to prove that at the closing of the Jewish age, but remember, not one time did he do it to the Gentile, only to the Jew and the woman at the well of Samaria. The Jews recognized it, the true Jew, that's the Messiah. You're the Son of God, the King of Israel. But there were those who stood by and said, he's Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. See? Still the same today. But he said, don't go to the Gentiles while we were heathens in those days. But now they were looking for the Messiah. Now we've been looking 2,000 years for him, have we? Well, then when our age is closing, if God, as I said last night, if he acts one time upon anything, he's got to act the same every time. Or he acted wrong the first time. See? He can't take anything back. We get smarter. He's infinite to begin with. He don't get any smarter. He can't because he's perfect always. So his first decision is every decision the same. So at the close of this age, he couldn't let us mani be manifested himself to us as our creeds and our denominations. He's got to manifest himself the same as he did them. He didn't recognize their creeds. He come and showed signs by perceiving his thought, doing what the Father told him to do. And they called him a devil, a fortune teller. He's got to do the same. He did the same to the Samaritans. What did that woman say? She said, well, come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? I said last night, she know more about God than half the preachers. And that's right. Now, if he manifests himself the same tonight, how many will believe him? It's your meeting. God bless you. Prayer card. Where's Billy? What? One to a hundred. What in? R. Prayer card R. One to a hundred. Can't all line at once, but as soon as I come down the line as far as I can, I want to... I want some of them to take over after I leave. I'll try to get the whole group if I can. Who has prayer card R number one? Raise up your hand. Would you raise your hand? R number two. Raise up your hand. R number two. 
Right there, three. R number three. Number four. Over here. All right, sir. Number five. Come here, sir. Number five. Who has R number five? Would you raise your hand? Look at your somebody near you. These people here, maybe in these chairs, can't get their hands up. R number five. Raise your hand, will you? Have I missed it? Shake your hand way up if you can. Now look at your neighbor's card. Somebody said it may be somebody deaf can't hear us. R number five. All right. Losing their place. All right. R number five. Number six. Right there. Number seven. Number seven. That's it. Seven, eight. Now, if number five is out, comes in, let us know. Number eight, number nine, raise your hand quick. All right, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve, did I see it? Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, eighteen, nineteen, Nineteen, nine, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. That's good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, thirty. How much room you got out there? All right. Now, just remember, as your numbers file, when that line goes to going a little bit lower now, Start 31, 2, 3. We don't care how many stands. We just don't want you to have to stand too long. Because in discernment. Now, let's stop right there. Just let everyone stand for, I uh, mean, everyone be seated just for a moment or two. Just be real reverent now. Real reverent. How many in the building here that doesn't have a prayer card and you want God to heal you and you believe you have faith enough to touch his garment and he'll turn around to high priest? Raise your hand. Say, I want a prayer, Brother Branham. God heal me. Raise your hands way up high now. See, all the way around. All right. Then, you're having a prayer card now, and you want God to heal you. All right. Now, you just watch this way. Be real reverent. Believe with all your heart. See if God doesn't do it. All right. How many you got lined up down there now? Dr. Vail, how many is lined up? How are you coming on? All there, but number one, number five. Has number five come in yet? R, was it R or P? Which was it? R, R number five. You sure you looked at everybody and think somebody deaf now? Because sometime I go, I get a letter and say, Brother Branham, I was deaf and nobody, I didn't know you called my number. See? And then I, I don't like that. I couldn't raise up, Brother Branham, and, and nobody looked at my card. I wouldn't want that to happen. See? Certainly not. Now, that don't mean they're going to be healed. It just means they, they're called by their number. Now, all right, we'll start the prayer line anyhow. Now, um, now, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, now, please, friends, I want you to be just as reverent as you can be, quite reverent. Now, while especially the anointing is going on, then if someone is made well or something happens, of course you rejoice. I, I believe in shouting and praising the Lord and how all it goes with the gospel. I believe in a full Pentecostal square meal. I believe in all of it. But you see, we have to approach God quietly, sanely, reverently. Then when we get what we ask for, then turn and thank Him for it. Well, everyone understands that, don't you? Now, be real reverent. Now, I want you to... Don't move around. See, each one of you are a spirit. How many knows that? Sure you are. And if you move... See, actually, you have a grip of the people. And you move, then it interferes. And don't take a blank picture, do you? Now... Why don't you start to pray? Now, let's just not be, don't be nervous now. Sit quiet. Don't think what time it is. Nothing has nothing to do with it. That's what. If Christ is arisen from the dead, while well, brother, sister, we got everything to be happy about. If he hasn't risen from the dead, then let us go and eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
Now, if he is the Son of God and he keeps his word by appearing here on the platform in the form of spirit, and this picture here of the angel of the Lord that was in the Moses with Moses in the burning bush, made manifested in Jesus Christ, the works that it did then, then he said a little while, I come from God, I go to God, return back in the form of the Holy Spirit in a pillar of fire again. Now, you say, Brother Branham, was that, that what struck Paul down? There's a light. Nobody else saw it but Paul. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Is that right? He said, I come from God and go to God. When he was on earth, he said, I was the I am that was in the bush. So then, you see, the works that I do shall you also. Now, if that angel that got his picture on that paper, if it doesn't produce the same life that Jesus did when he was here on earth, then this is the wrong vine. It's the wrong thing. If it produced great things of something else, then it, that's what it is. But it'll have to produce the same kind of a life. Look, as my Father sent me, so send I you. How many know the Scripture says that? Well, look, the Father that sent him went in him. The Jesus that sends his man goes in his man. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. Now, if we do not the works of Christ, then believe the message. But I've read it out of the Bible. And if he doesn't do the same thing, then all right, he isn't the same. If he does, we'll all be happy. I'm just trying to get you quiet. See, that's why I was taking this time for quiet you. One case will prove it. Now, the lady, I don't know her. We're strangers to each other, I suppose. All right. Just so that the people might know, we don't, I'm not asking you to swear because the Bible said don't do it, but the people might know, I have never seen you in my life and we're total strangers one another. Just raise up her hand so the people will see. I've never seen her, heard of her in my life. Know nothing, not one thing about, there is a person here out in there that I know. I saw, I heard Brother Young Brown a while ago. Some of them said he was in the meeting, uh, but I don't know where he's at. Brother Young, if you're here, God bless your heart. But I don't know, he, he, some of them said he was at the meeting yesterday and today. I haven't seen him. But that'd be the only person that I can see in this building. How many of you out there know that I don't know nothing about you? Raise your hand. I see. This year, what these people up here for? Just to get the anointing started. Then it moves out into the audience to whoever you are out there. Stick. Just look up to the high priest and say, Lord God, let me tonight. Let me just touch you. And then you speak right back through your branches and prove that. That's the way you did it when you were here yesterday. That's the way you do it today. You're forever the same. See if he does it. Just be sincere. Now here is a picture of the a Bible picture, St. John 4. Here's a man and a woman meeting for their first time in life. And in St. John 4, Jesus met a woman at the well, a Samaritan. I'm a lot older than a woman. We're different ages probably born in different countries, and the first time we've ever met in life. Now, if I walked up and said, Sister, hallelujah, you're going to get well, you're sick. She might be an infidel. She might be here as a deceiver. You've seen and heard of them coming to the line too, haven't you? Yes, sir. Remember that, that night you go to hypnotize me? Come in there and said, the devil sent you in here, and because you did that, you'll have to be packed out. He's still paralyzed. So you see him on a platform, drop, and so forth. Just let the Holy Spirit. We're not playing church. This is God. You say, what are you stalling for, Brother Branham, for that angel of the Lord? Right. If he doesn't come, I'll have to pass the woman through. I'll have to do just as I would if it wasn't this gift. Now, you don't have to have the gift to do it. That's not one thing to do with her healing. And it's the only to let the, each one of you know, if he does it, that there is a supernatural being here that's proving the thing that Jesus promised that would take place. That if he keeps that promise, he keeps every promise. Now, I want to talk to her just a moment to see that if, if he would say something to her. Now, I'm not knowing you, never seeing you in my life. If the Lord Jesus would tell me something, uh, if I said, well, you're sick, that could be a guess. Lay my hands on you and say, go on, get well. Praise the Lord. That could be all right. You could do it. And you could be God that did it, speaking through me. But then you could wonder about that. But if he goes back now somewhere down in life, 
maybe many years or whatever it is, as he did when that old fisherman come, told him who he was, told him his name, told him what his father's name was. What about that? When he told Nathaniel, I saw you when you were under the tree, he said, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. Now, if he would tell me one thing about you that you know I don't know, it has to come through supernatural scripture. Then you'd say, if he knows what was, he surely will know what will be. Now the Holy Spirit's here. That angel that you see on the picture is not two feet from where I'm standing right now. That's thus saith the Lord. Remember, I'll meet you with the Queen of Sheba in the presence of Jesus Christ. At that day, I take every spirit in here under my control for his glory. I do as you're told. Be ready. The woman is a Christian. Now, I'm not saying that because she's crying. Hypocrites cry and infidels and everything else make believe. But the woman is a Christian. And the woman's suffering with the condition of her back. And that's what she wants me to pray for. That's right. If that's right, raise up your hand straight up in the air. There it is. You believe now? Now you say, now you're not saying it tonight, but you might think that I was guessing that. Find out. She's a good person. She's not looking at me. She has her eyes closed. I don't have to look at her. God's just as great over here as he is over here. May he grant it. Yes. I see the woman. She's suffering with a trouble in her back. That's right. And then she has trouble in her, her breast also. That's right. That's right, isn't it? And you might know me to be God's prophet, or his servant, rather. You got somebody on your heart you're praying for. That's the aged couple. It's your father and your mother. They're ill. And another thing, do you believe me to be God's prophet or his servant? You've got a dear friend that's a neighbor of yours that you're praying for. And besides that, you're praying for all of them to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I hear you ask it at a bedside before you come. That's right. That's right. Wave your hand like this. Thank you, Lord. You have received what you've asked for. Go on your road rejoicing, because you shall have what you ask for. Find your father and mother well. If thou canst believe... Now, be real reverent. Don't doubt. Do you believe that the same Jesus that knows the woman's heart at the well is the same Jesus here tonight in a form of the vine, and we are his branches? How many believe that now? Then it should be settled. I'll be just reverent. We've got a few standing here in the line. I just trust that he'll do something else for us. That's enough. That proves it. Which is it, please? I'm not beside myself, but you can imagine visions and being weak as I am, you don't know where you're at sometimes. Well, you say, that's strange. Did you know Elisha didn't know where he was at for 40 days and nights and God found him pulled back in a cave? After a vision come to him? Daniel was troubled at his head for many days from one vision. We're strangers to each other. This is our first time meeting. You just, somebody, somebody give you a prayer call. And when them prayer cards was given out, they were brought up here before the people and all mixed up together and just give them wherever they will. You don't know where you get because sometimes we start from one place and another. doesn't matter. Just a prayer card with, a, with my name on it and a number on it. That's all. But God knows you. Now, if he will reveal to me what you're here for, would you believe me to be his servant? And you believe then that it would be a spirit. You'd have to know that there's some kind of a spirit in here that would know that because it couldn't come through human beings. That would be a more of a miracle than to see that little crippled baby get up and walk. Do you know that? Psychic emotion could bring that baby up and walk. Right. Psychic emotion can bring that boy from the wheelchair. Psychic emotion can't foretell and tell what will be and what has been. Can't do it. That takes spirit of God. The lady is here. She wants me to pray for her for something's wrong in her mouth. 
That's pyrrhea of your gums. That thus saith the Lord. Just a moment. I've seen something else appear. It's a child. Oh, you've got a child that's got bad feet. That's right. Thus saith the Lord. And, and you're not from here. You come from the northwest. You're from the panhandle. You come from a city called Lubbock, Texas. Return. You have what you ask for. Jesus Christ makes you well. Have faith in God. Now, don't doubt. Don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart, with all that's in you. Just have faith. Have faith in God. We are strangers to each other. Is this our first time meeting? I'll be real reverent. Something keeps taking place back in here. Now, don't doubt. Just believe with all your heart. A lady sitting there with a little checker-looking dress on, pink or green or what it is, looking right across this way, praying with arthritis. You believe the Lord healed you then, sister? You believe it with all your heart? If you believe it, you may receive it. God will make you well. Moving in the audience, it goes across to a lady with her head bowed. Right back here, sitting with her head bowed. The second woman in, she's suffering with a liver trouble. What did you touch, sister? I don't know you do. If that's right, raise your hand. I've never seen you in my life. You believe me to be God's prophet? Or, excuse me for saying that, his servant? All right. I've never seen you. Your condition, where a dark streak hung over you, is passed away. Your faith has healed you. I want to ask you something. If that isn't the Spirit of Jesus Christ acting the same as it did yesterday, what is it? That you might know me be his servant. The lady sitting next to you there, being the spirits on you, she's suffering with heart trouble that she wants to be healed. That's right, lady, stand up on your feet. You believe me to be God's servant? I don't know you do. That's right. Lay your hand on the lady sitting next to you that just raised up. She's got back trouble. She wants to be healed up. Stand up, lady. Jesus Christ makes you well. If you believe me to be God's servant, the lady sitting next to her is the lady's got trouble in her side. She's got side trouble. Is that right, lady? It is right. Stand up and raise your hand. Your faith has healed you. Does that take all the superstition away from it? It's God. I don't know those people, but your faith is healed. You go home, you're well. What did they touch? They never touched me. They're 15 yards from me. It's the high priest, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the resurrected one. Don't doubt. Believe. I'm sorry. It was in the audience. I just have to work as the Spirit moves. It's such a weakening affair. Are we strangers? I don't know you and you don't know me. If God will tell me what you're here for, you believe me to be his servant, you know something's going on. That scene between you and I stands that line. You're moving from and you're moving way away. I can tell you right now you're not from around here because you're from a wooded country where there's much heavy timber and wood. And you're suffering with a female trouble, and you've got a desire in your heart to have a baby, and you can't have the baby. And you come from Denver, Colorado. Thus saith the Lord. That's right. Go home and receive your child. God will give it to you. Be real, Reverend. Have faith. Don't doubt. Believe with all your heart. With that foot trouble sitting there, you believe that God will make you well? You accept it? Believe it and he'll do it? All right. It's over then. God bless you.
I don't know you, young man, do I? Never seen him alive. But you were sitting there praying, wasn't you? See? I've never seen him alive, but you're healed, young man. Your faith has made you well. This elderly lady sitting here with the glasses on had a foot trouble, too. She's been suffering, and when I said that to that person, then she had faith, too. You believe that God healed you also? That's right. I don't know you do. I. But when I said foot to that man there, it made you jump, didn't it? The Holy Spirit struck you and healed you right there. You are healed. Your faith makes you whole. Amen. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Sitting back there with a handkerchief up to your face, crying with that stomach trouble, forget it. God heals you. I challenge your faith in Jesus Christ, saying, to believe that that's Him anointing me or doing it. Now, you know why? You know why that woman is healed? That devil thought he'd, he'd catch that. This man right here is suffering with stomach trouble. That's right. You have something wrong with your stomach. That's right. And see, that spirit was moving from there, calling to that demon out there for help. There's a black streak running from the man there, and I saw the vision between them. I'll tell you something else, sir. Do you believe me to be his prophet? All right. That sore in your mouth will go away, too. You believe that he'll do that? All right, sir. You're not from this country, either. You're from Oklahoma. Your name is Mr. Meadows. Return back. You're healed. Jesus Christ makes you well. Don't believe me. You believe God healed that arthritis while you're sitting there? Go on off the platform rejoicing, saying, thank you, Lord. I want to show you. You have a nervous heart. And that's the many pulling out there. Let me show you. Come here just a minute. Here's the reason I can't call it now. The Holy Spirit's trying to... I'll show you something. That's not me, but the Lord will, if you'll just believe me. Look here. Watch here. Here's the reason I can't call it. Everybody out there suffering with nervousness of any type, stand up to your feet. See, now, how can you call that? Stand on your feet just a minute. Have faith. Come here. Stand right here. Look to me. Do you believe me to be his prophet? If God will reveal to me what's your trouble, do you believe it? You got asthma. Coughing. All with asthma, stand on your feet. Every word would bother with asthma, coughing, stand on your feet. Heart trouble, stand right here. All with heart trouble, stand on your feet. Believe you got a mental nervousness. That is deep thinking, crossing bridges before you get to them. Taking other things that don't happen the way you always think it does. It's a mental nervousness. This whole group, some or other, bound with that. Move over to one side just a minute. Have faith in God and believe with all your heart. If God can heal right here, He can heal out there. How many believers is in here? Raise your hand. Does God keep His word? Look. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. Did he say it? Well, who said it? The same Jesus that's here now speaking. Not a dead God, a risen God. What is here greater than Solomon? It's the resurrected Jesus. He's in your presence now, and you're in his presence. Lay your hands on one another. Every sick person in here, lay your hand on the person and pray like you do in your own church. There's only one thing to keep you, everyone, from being healed. All of this one time. That's unbelief. And I'm going to ask these ministers to stand on their feet and pray with me that we'll cast out unbelief. If you can get the devil of unbelief out, this is going to be the greatest night you've ever seen. All of you in the wheelchairs, everywhere, get ready to walk out. Almighty God. In the name of Jesus, come to our rescue, thou the morning star, the Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end. Oh, Satan, you are exposed. You've lost the battle. Come out of this audience. In the name of Jesus Christ.